The reign of the ten-year-old Vladislav IV, known as Vladislav the Kuman, started with the regency of his Kuman mother, Elizabeth, and feudal anarchy. Great noble houses fought for influence and control in the realm, while the House of Arpad sat almost powerless. The great nobility fought each other for control of land, and in those lands they started to build castles, mint their own coins, raise their own armies, and hand out titles, all without royal permission. In 1274, one of the lords, Henry Heder Kosei, captured Vladislav's brother, Prince Andrew, and just as he was on the verge of becoming kingmaker, he was killed in battle by another noble, Peter Tsisak. Peter Tsisak continued the war against the Heder Kosekis. Most importantly for this story, in 1276, his war resulted in the capture and looting of the city of Vespram, where Heder Kosegi was a bishop. But most importantly, he looted the cathedral of Vespram. Actually, quite a lot of church property became targets, if not just collateral damage in the chaos. At around the same time, residents of Alba Iulia in Transylvania expressed their dissatisfaction with their local bishop by burning down the cathedral, which then spread the fire onto the rest of the town. The bishops of the realm, unhappy about all the cathedrals that were being burned and all the land that was being looted, and generally unhappy about the state of chaos in the realm, stepped in and called for a council on Rakosh Field in 1277. To the council, the king summoned not only all of the clergy and nobility of the realm, but also Kuman delegates. The council declared King Ladislav IV of age and asked him to restore peace and order to the kingdom by getting rid of pestilences. Ladislav, now with authority, proceeded to form an alliance with Rudolf von Habsburg, the elected king of Germany and new claimant to the Duchy of Austria, and the two helped each other. Ladislav helped Rudolf in a war against our old friend Ottokar II Premsil, king of Bohemia, and Rudolf helped Ladislav in his efforts to bring the noble families into line. King Ottokar II of Bohemia ended up mortally wounded at the Battle of Marchfeld in 1278, and the death of Ottokar also meant that quite a few noble families in the realm lost their main foreign sponsor. Now, things were going fine. It looked like Ladislav IV might actually take control of the realm. Then in 1279, a papal delegate showed up. Two or three years beforehand, the bishops of the realm had called on the Pope to send help in the complete and utter chaos. The papal response finally arrived when things had relatively calmed down. The papal delegate, Philip the Bishop of Fermo, after hearing about the situation in Hungary, either on his own initiative or after being led on by some other people, decided to deal with a completely different problem, and that was the still very pagan Kumans living in Hungary. Philip issued a declaration, backed by a good portion of the Hungarian clergy and nobility, that the Kumans had to abandon their pagan ways, be baptized, convert to Catholicism, and that the Kumans should, and I quote, settle down and leave their tents and felt houses, and reside in villages of the Christian sort, with buildings attached to the ground, end quote, as opposed to Jewish villages, which, as we all know, are erected on jello. The Kumans were allowed to keep their traditional beards and way of dress, but that's beside the point. King Ladislav IV, half Kuman and raised by a Kuman mother, did show a great affinity for them and try to block Philip's declaration with no success. Soon enough, the Kumans revolted, and the king joined them starting a civil war in the realm. Depending on your interpretation of the law here, some could say that it was one of those situations where the king had rebelled against the crown. Legally speaking, he might have been waging war against himself. Ladislav and the Kumans captured Bishop Philip, and after being released, Philip swore he would never return to the realm of St. Stephen, not even if the Pope ordered him to. Then Ladislav, after getting rid of the meddlesome bishop, decided to reassert his authority as king over the Kumans and went back to leading his royal army, defeating the Kumans at the Battle of Lake Hod. Then in 1284, Ladislav grew more and more tired and frustrated with court life, with his wife, with his nobility and clergy, and presumably the entire realm. He ran away. 
back to the Kumans, where he stayed. Ladislav IV, the apostolic king of Hungary, as best I can describe it, goes completely and utterly native. He started wearing Kuman clothing, started worshipping pagan gods, created a new bodyguard of Kuman warriors, and created a harem of Kuman girls. Although the king would still attempt to control the realm, a lot of the courtiers that followed him slowly started to abandon their king. With the king's authority and legitimacy now in question, chaos began to reign. Great nobles once again battled against each other, each attempting to grab more land, more power, more influence. The title of Palatine changed hands very frequently, while Archbishop Lodomir of Estragom attempted to bring about some form of unity through repeated councils and assemblies. Then came the Mongol invasion of 1285, which Ladislav IV managed to defeat. But Ladislav's relation to the Kumans and complete abandonment of usual royal practice resulted in accusations that he had invited the Mongols to invade, further questioning the king's legitimacy. As things spiraled more and more out of control, Archbishop Lodomir had had enough. He declared another excommunication of Ladislav IV, the first one happened during Ladislav's first revolt, and in a response Ladislav IV swore bloody revenge, saying that he will kill and drive the whole of the clergy back to Rome. Just as the clergy were on the verge of convincing the Pope to declare a crusade against Ladislav, Ladislav died on July the 10th, 1290, killed by a group of Kumans for still unknown reason. Ladislav IV had no legitimate heirs. The chaos that reigned during Ladislav's reign had allowed many noble families to rise to even greater prominence, and a few now saw themselves as kingmaker. They had been preparing this move for years, waiting for Ladislav to finally be out of the picture. A portion of the notables of the realm invited the alleged grandson of Andrew II, Andrew III, son of Stephen Posthumus, to rule the realm while Ladislav was still alive. While another portion of the notables, notably Paul Shubic, Ban of Dalmatia and Croatia, invited Charles Martel d'Anjou to take the throne. And after Charles Martel died in 1295, they supported his young son, Charles Robert. But as Andrew III will soon find out, these loyalties are not as clear-cut as they first appear to be. And so Andrew will struggle all his reign. Upon his ascension, Andrew III was made to sign a coronation diploma, where he swore to obey the laws and uphold liberties. He was also made to promise that he would end the chaos that reigned in the realm by destroying unlawfully built fortresses, returning stolen land to the rightful owners, and to call a yearly assembly of the realm. But this was to no avail. Much of the nobility didn't respect Andrew's authority, so they kept undermining him at best, revolting at worst. So Andrew III spent his reign playing dynastic whack-a-mole. He even had to deal with another pretender who alleged to be the brother of Ladislav IV, Prince Andrew, who had actually died in 1278. And there was still the revolting Shubic and his candidate to deal with. Andrew III was losing grasp on the situation. The now overbearing so-called oligarchs didn't see the point of giving up or falling in line. For some of them, Andrew was not the legitimate king, while most of them simply had more to gain by not falling in line. Andrew III died on the 14th of January, 1301. As one of his contemporaries put it, the last branch fell off of the golden tree of Arpad.